So now we have question period, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my first question this morning is for the Premier. Speaker, COVID-19 is tearing through our communities. At this point, almost 750 people are in ICUs, literally struggling to breathe. On Friday, the Premier decided not to take the advice of the medical experts that asked him to deal with this horrifying situation in our province. He chose not to. Will he instead do that today? Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker. Well, in fact, we have been taking the advice of the medical experts since this pandemic began. We have been taking their advice with respect to the need to uh, maintain physical distancing, to uh, follow the public health rules, to uh, the declaration of the state of emergency most recently in the stay-at-home order. We also followed the advice that was given to us that we needed to step down on scheduled surgeries, which we did. We followed the advice with respect to rolling out and, and redeploying health human resources from one location to another to make sure that in hot spots we had adequate people to care for those in intensive care. And we also followed their advice in order to be able to move patients around if necessary from one location to another to deploy all of our health uh, workforce and our health uh, availability in intensive care and other units across the province. So in that, in everything else, Response. we have followed the health experts every step along the way during this pandemic. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, the Minister of Health knows that that is not the case. In fact, members of the science table, to a one, every single member of the science table disagrees with the statement that this minister just made. Speaker, frontline staff are literally, were literally sobbing in hallways of hospitals uh, when they saw the Ford government's press conference on Friday. Experts have been pleading with this government to protect vulnerable workers. The Premier instead decided to close playgrounds and give police sweeping powers that they didn't want and that they won't use. Speaker, the government's expert advice from the science table has been very, very clear. Why will the Ford government not take the advice of the experts? Why will they not? Question. And will they finally do so today and help save lives of Ontarians? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. In fact, our government has taken the advice of the Health Science Advisory Table, the Public Health Measures Table, Dr. Williams, our Chief Medical Officer of Health, the medical health officers in each of the 34 public health unit regions. That is why we, ended, we decided to deploy 25 per cent of all of the vaccines off the top before they're delivered to the 34 public health unit regions in order to dedicate those extra vaccines to the hotspot areas. We know that's where a lot of the transmission is happening, and if we're able to do that, we will be able to get the numbers more under control, to reduce the number of people in ICU, to save more lives. That is the goal of all of this. That's what we're following. That's what the medical health officers recommended, and that's what we're doing. Final supplementary. The experts were very clear what we need in Ontario to save lives and save the health of our people. Paid sick days, not carding. Essential workers being vaccinated, not being stopped for checks. Shutting down of workplaces where COVID-19 is spreading. Not shutting down playgrounds, Speaker, playgrounds and soccer fields. The advice was very, very clear. I think that we need to hear from the Premier in this government exactly whose advice are they taking, because they clearly are not taking the advice of the experts. Will he finally, will this Premier finally start listening to those frontline health care workers and the experts who are pleading with him to do the right thing? Minister Health. Thank you, Speaker. And in fact, uh, what the uh, 
Chief Medical Officer of Health has recommended, what the science advisory table has recommended, is that we need to have enhanced public health measures because this is spreading within our communities. We need to stop that. That's why the recommendation was made with respect to the closure of playgrounds because of close community interaction. However, we did hear from people that this was not something they wanted. We are listening. That is why we made that change. But we are still asking people to please follow those public health measures. That is how this transmission is happening. That is what the medical experts have told us. And that is also why we're deploying 25% of the vaccines off the top to go into those health uh, hotspot areas, because we know if we can deal with those hotspot areas, that is going to be good for the entire province, because that will reduce transmission and make our hospitals be able to cope with the numbers of people that are coming in and reduce the number of people that we have in Spons. intensive care units. That is all part of the advice that we've received, and that is what we are following. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, Speaker, my next question is also for the Premier. Nobody agrees with the Premier. Nobody agrees with the Premier. The science table has publicly asked for a correction of course, a course correction. That's what the science table is saying, not what the minister is suggesting. The police publicly rebuked this government on the regulation they brought forward on Friday. Even the PC caucus seems to be in revolt when it comes to the decisions their own government is making. We need to fix this scenario. The government can do that. We need to prioritize the saving of lives, the health and well-being of Ontarians, the saving of our hospitals and our health care system. Will the government do the right thing, reverse course, and actually implement the measures that the experts have been telling him are necessary to save Ontarians' lives? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Well, our government has been following the recommendations made by the Medical Officer of Health, the Science Advisory Table, and others. Our goal is to save the lives of the people of Ontario, to protect their health and well-being. That is why we've taken the steps that we've had. And we, we, we are, understand that there's a lot of transmission in the community that we need to limit mobility as much as possible for the next few weeks. This is a very, very difficult state that we're in. We recognize that. And we know that we need to vac roll out those vaccines as quickly as possible. That's why they're available in vaccination hotspots. They're available in private clinics. They're available in pharmacies. What we need is a greater supply so that we can get more needles into more arms as fast as possible. That is what we're doing. We are working with the federal government, and we know that we need to move fast on this and to reduce transmission. We followed this advice from the Chief Medical Officer of Health all along. With respect to the science advisory Response. table, we, I know there's an issue with respect to some of the items that they are concerned about. I will deal with that in my supplemental. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, speaker, the very science advisory table that this minister claims that the Premier is following the advice of said we cannot vaccinate ourselves out of this crisis. That's what they said. They said that weeks ago. But the government didn't listen. Doctors, including the government's own experts, feel betrayed and they feel frightened. Dr. Peter Uni says this. Yesterday, which referring to Friday, was one of the darkest days in my professional career and also personally. It's just wrong, you know? It's just wrong. Dr. Ashley Chute said, I quote, I feel sick. I actually feel sick. If they don't get this now, they're not going to get it. It's been a few hours, but I am still shaking. Speaker, lives are at stake in our province. People are dying of COVID-19. Will the Premier finally admit that the measures he announced Friday were the wrong measures Question. and actually take the advice of the experts and implement measures that will save lives and get us out of this horror show that we're all living? 
Thank you. We have been following the recommendations made by the science advisory table all along. I understand that Dr. Uni is concerned that not all of the public health regions that they recommended were included in the list that we projected. However, it's really important to understand that that is not the only thing that one needs to look at in identifying hotspots. We looked at what the recommendations made by the science advisory table, but we also need to look at hospitalizations, outbreak data, low testing rates, and deaths during the second wave of the pandemic. We also need to look at some of the socio economic barriers that are preventing people from coming in to receive the vaccines. All of those were taken into account in identifying the hot spots across this province. All of those were taken into account with the best interests of the health and well-being of the people of Ontario. We started with that at the beginning of this pandemic. It continues to be our main focus, response. and it will be throughout our response to it. This is the final supplementary. Speaker, Lives are at stake. Lives are being lost. People are struggling to breathe in the ICUs, which are bursting at the seams with COVID-19 patients. Dr. Andrew Morris says this, and I quote, 18 months ago, we talked about hallway medicine. Now we're talking about hallway deaths and tent deaths. We need a government that will listen to science. The Premier has to start listening to the pleas of the frontline ICU doctors and nurses, not to the anti-shutdown, anti-science wing of the PC caucus. Will he start doing that? Mr. Health. Thank you, Speaker. We have been listening to the uh, recommendations made to us by the uh, medical experts, by the epidemiologists. That has been the case every step along the way. And what we've been trying to do in addition to reduce transmission is build capacity in our ICUs. We started that a year ago. We've built over 3,400 beds in our system, which is the size of six community hospitals that have started. We've added over 285 intensive care beds. What we're doing now is making sure that we can use our entire health capacity to make sure that we can use every single bed that we need to use. That is why we're transferring patients, if we have to, from one location to another as close as possible to their home location. That is why we're redeploying staff from all across the province. We are working with other provinces to assist some of their assistance as well. And that is why, unfortunately, we've had to uh, postpone slightly uh, the uh, scheduled surgeries and procedures so that we will have the people in the hospital to care for the COVID patients who would otherwise be carried for the uh, surgical patients. All of that is on the basis of medical advice that we're receiving on a daily basis. And the next question, Leader of the Opposition. You, Speaker, Speaker, um, my next question is also to the Premier. The Premier had a whole year to plan to avoid the crisis that we're in. And instead, what he's ended up doing now is, is having to deal with a scramble, a scramble, begging Conservative premiers around the province for help that they can't provide, rejecting help from the Red Cross, unbelievably rejecting help from the Red Cross when it was offered last week. He is putting petty politics in front of, ahead of human life, and it's a disgrace. There's a nightmare scenario happening right now in ICUs. Almost 750 patients in ICUs in our province. How can the Premier possibly justify rejecting any offer Question. of help when Ontarians' lives are at stake? Thank you, Speaker. Well, we have taken every step possible and are continuing to do so to build capacity in our health care system and our intensive care system. It's one thing to have the beds. It's another thing to have the health human resources to be able to operate them. In some part, we will already have the health human resources because they are already there. They would otherwise be dealing with surgical patients. We have to postpone that somewhat. We'll get back to that as soon as we can. We know we have that internally, but we're also looking at Ontario Health, at the former LINs. We're looking 
looking at making sure that we can bring in more students, student extern program that we already have. We had 900 spots filled as of February. We can extend that to 3,200 people with pharmacy technicians and other technicians. We are building that capacity to be able to deal with this. But as a leader of the opposition should probably be aware, this is not just happening in Ontario. This is happening across Canada and around the world because of the variants. This is a new situation Response. we're dealing with now. They're very, very transmissible. That's why it's so important. We are asking people to please follow those public health measures. So Thank you. The final supplementary. Speaker, the Premier of this province needs to stop the political posturing. He has to stop. People are dying of COVID-19 by the thousands. Order. What we need in our province is paid sick days, not carding. What we need is giving essential workers the vaccinations that they need, not giving them spot checks on the side of the road. What we need is to shut down workplaces where COVID-19 is spreading, not shut down playgrounds and soccer fields. We have to start putting human life. The Premier needs to start putting human life above his political pride. So my question is, can this Premier actually do that? Mr. Bell. Thank you, Speaker. Well, protecting human life has been our primary goal since this entire pandemic began. And I can assure the leader of the official opposition, through you, Speaker, that that is the Premier's primary goal right now. He has been working day and night trying to get assistance for Ontario right now. He is working very, very hard. He's working with other Premiers. We're looking at other countries to try and get assistance to make sure that we have health human resources, Order. in part to Order. relieve the people that we know who are already in the front lines are working day and night night to save lives. That is, Leader of the opposition, come to order. is what we're working on. And in terms of what we're doing to protect human life, we are dedicating 25 percent of all vaccines that come in to go into those hotspots, to go into those factories, to go into those workplaces, to make sure that we can vaccinate uh, people who are living in some of those hotspots. That is the plan. That Response. is what we're going to do, and that is what's going to save lives. The next question, the member for Willowdale. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, in the week of April 4th to 10th, the data available shows that no fewer than 39 international flights landed at Pearson International Airport with confirmed cases of COVID-19. On those flights combined, more than 450 rows of passengers are considered affected by the confirmed positive cases. Speaker, depending on the size of these planes, we are talking about maybe 1,300 to the leader of the opposition will come to order. Passengers or more. The spread of COVID-19 and dangerous, dangerous uh, variants of concern is only made worse by cases coming from other countries. Yes. Speaker, will the government call on the federal government to secure our airports as the federal government should have done months and months ago? The government has uh, Thank you very much. I just want to thank the, the member for Willowdale for that, uh, that question. It is uh, obviously something that, uh, that is very serious and certainly impacts uh, uh, Toronto, uh, Calgary, uh, and, uh, and, and Vancouver and Montreal. Uh, this is really where the variants of concern uh, really started to, uh, to come into, uh, into these provinces. Uh, we have been calling on the federal go government right from the beginning to secure our airports. Look, as the member highlighted, 27, up to 2,700 passengers a week who could be infected and, and into our communities right here in, in uh, the province of Ontario. It's just too much, Mr. Speaker. So yes, again, we will be calling on the federal government to do its part to secure uh, our airports, uh, Mr. Speaker, so that we can continue to, uh, to make progress on, uh, on not only attacking but defeating COVID. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The data also shows that no fewer than 14 domestic flights landed at Pearson with confirmed cases of COVID-19. On these flights combined, more than 80 rows of passengers are considered effective by positive cases. Speaker, depending on the size of these planes, we're talking about maybe 200 to 250 passengers or more. The spread of COVID-19 and dangerous, uh, dangerous variants of concern is only made worse by the fact that this virus is coming in from other provinces. Speaker, will the government call on the federal government to secure our airports as the federal government should have done long ago? 
Government House Leader, reply. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And the member is quite correct. It is also domestic flights because, as you know, uh, uh, many of the international flights then result in domestic flights across uh, across the country, and uh, that is why uh, Ontario is uh, is working with both Manitoba and Quebec to uh, ensure that we can secure uh, our borders. But ultimately, Mr. Speaker, we need the federal government to take a more active role. We have been calling on them for months. When we started hearing about the variants of concern, whether it was from Brazil, whether it was from the UK, we had called on the federal government Order. to show some leadership at our airports, Mr. Speaker. It was this premier and this government that had it had to institute. To testing at uh, at the airports, uh, Mr. Speaker, we had to lead the way with, in terms of isolation. But ultimately, Mr. Speaker, whether it's international flights or domestic flights, uh, we need the federal government to start showing some leadership. Help us by securing uh, those uh, international airports, Mr. Speaker, so that we can save Response. and protect, uh, as we said, up to 2,700 people just on international flights and up to 500 domestically, Mr. Speaker. It's a big number. We need to get under control. The next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we have over 4,447 new cases as of today. Scarborough has an average of 24%, once again, positivity rates. With neighborhoods where there are almost 1,000 cases per 100,000 people. Mr. Speaker, I really hope the Speaker is listening. Because frankly, these days I feel like he's not listening to me or the people of this province or his caucus members. So today, I, I, and I know that many Ontarians are listening to us as we speak in this house. So I hope he understands the reality that we're facing in this province and the outcry that's there in this province right now. We are on the international news or on CNN, BBC, and people are talking about us like they were talking about Italy last year. Speaker, last week, 10,000 of our vaccine appointments were canceled and two clinics closed. Question. Yesterday, I heard that two more days were canceled in Scarborough. And I know the minister will blame the federal government, and I know they have their procurement failures. But I'm asking the minister, because they have a responsibility of the disaster we have in Ontario, because they failed to protect our essential workers and distribute vaccines equ equ equitably. So I'm asking, Mr. Mr. Speaker, why is this government still not providing Scarborough and other... The Minister of Health to reply. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Of course, we have been listening every step of the long way. That is why 15 neighbourhoods in Scarborough have been identified as hotspots. And as you probably heard in my response to a previous question, that 25 per cent of all vaccines that we receive are now going to be designated to hotspots. That means that some areas where they have low rates of transmission will be receiving fewer vaccines. But that means places like Scarborough, that has 15 areas that are in hotspots, will be receiving receiving more vaccines. We understand that there are high rates in Scarborough. That is why we're making this change, so that there will be additional vaccines coming to Scarborough, making sure that your constituents and all the people in Scarborough will be protected. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the Minister for her answer. There are 15 areas identified, and I have personally identified locations in my area uh, for, for uh, the mobile clinic speaker. And I'm going to reach out to the Minister's office directly because we don't have a single mobile clinic in Scarborough yet. Shame. And we, are, we have 24% positivity rate and essential workers, racialized community members who still cannot get their vaccines. And senior speaker, people who are still waiting but the end from phase one. And if you're listening to experts, listening to Ontarians, well, let me tell you this, doctors have repeatedly told us that Scarborough is on fire with COVID-19. Our hospitals are on the brink with ICUs full and these patients who are critically ill with COVID are essential workers, the most vulnerable people. The science table has made it very clear that we need to prioritize our hardest hit, hardest hit regions, that we need, to, we need decisive actions around workplace safety, protect our essential workers. Instead, on Friday, this government chose a police state over public health, chose regulations Question. that unfairly harm low-income and racialized people like those in my community. Mr. Speaker, I want to quote Dr. Shail Rawal, who very beautifully said, they looked at us in the eye and said, your labor is essential, but your lives are not. So, Mr. Speaker, my question is, why is this government refusing to listen to experts and pro provide paid citizens? Thank you. Thank you. Members, please take your seat. 
Minister of Health to reply. Thank you, Speaker. And I would say to the member, through you, Mr. Speaker, that what she's suggesting is absolutely not the case. You've already heard the Order. indication that recognizing that there are 15 hotspot areas within Scarborough, Scarborough will Order. be receiving additional vaccines. With respect to where people can receive the vaccines, I can advise that there are 51 pharmacies in Scarborough that are providing vaccines, six mass immunization clinics, and four primary care locations, which are going to be expanding, of course, as we receive more doses of the vaccine. But no one in Scarborough is being forgotten. Everyone who wants to receive a vaccine will get one, and we are going to prioritize people in their workplaces to make sure that they can be able to come in and get the vaccines. This is an area you are in a hot spot. There's no question about that. We've recognized that. We're providing more vaccines, and we're going to make sure we have more mobile units go in to help make sure that people in the workplaces can receive them. Response? The next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. This weekend, I spoke to many people in Scarborough who had their vaccination appointments cancelled. There were no alternatives offered. It's been over a week, no mobile clinics coming to support these people. Scarborough has been devastated by the cancellation of over 10,000 vaccination appointments at the Centennial College SHN Clinic. All of Scarborough is a hotspot, not just the 15 postal codes. 24 per cent positivity rate in the highest region. Last Friday, we were looking for a vaccination plan from this government to address our community. Instead, Scarborough and the province were left with something that really looks like police surveillance and a government-mandated carding. The only announcement addressing vaccination gap in Scarborough was a vague promise of 25 per cent more vaccines allotted to hotspots. Speaker, the people of this province deserve more. Scarborough residents deserve specifics. So, will the government tell us how many vaccines will the Premier deliver to the SHN Question. Scarborough Health Network this week to get all sites in Scarborough vaccinating people today? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. I can advise the member opposite that all of the hotspots that have been identified to date and others as they come forward will be provided uh, their share of the 25 per cent of vaccines off the top before the next allocation is given to the public health unit that they would normally receive equitably as with the other 34 public health unit regions. But as far as the closure of the clinics in Scarborough is concerned, I think it's important to remind the member opposite that the public health units themselves are responsible for receiving the distribution of uh, vaccines and making sure that they're allocated to all of the distribution spots where the vaccines are going to be administered. In the case of the Scarborough Health Network, as with others, uh, it's important to remember that the Toronto Public Health has a system so that when they receive the vaccines, they are allocated, and each vaccination site is advised Response. how much they are getting and when they will be receiving another allocation. However, there is a plan that is being delivered in accordance with the plan. All of the public health units are very well aware. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, back to the Premier. It is your government's responsibility. The modelling tells us that Hotspots are vaccinating at 5% lower than non-hotspots. That's wrong, and that has to be corrected quickly. Speaker, this government's enforcement of measures are offensive and erode public trust in government's ability to manage this crisis. Right after the Premier's announcement, police services made statements against implementing random checks, including Toronto and Peel. These powers have the greatest impact on black, indigenous, brown, and other people of color who feel targeted by these measures. They know what it's like to be carded and stopped without cause. BIPOC make up a large amount of essential workers Question. leaving their homes this morning to get to the front lines. Speaker, the Premier needs to support these workers and not find them. Will the Premier do the right thing for essential workers giving them paid sick leave, paid vaccination leave. Thank you. Thank you. The government house leader replying. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the question. As the honourable member is, is fully aware that the, uh, the first federal budget in two years uh, will be presented today, and it is our uh, complete expectation that the federal government uh, will move to supplement uh, the Canadian uh, 
uh, sick benefit uh, program. As you know, there is a significant surplus in the Ontario count, and we expect that, that uh, those changes will include a vaccination day, a paid vaccination day for essential workers, and that it will include uh, an elimination of the gap uh, between uh, when a worker uh, can apply and receives that benefit. So we're anxiously waiting, but we do expect that to be in the, in the federal government's uh, uh, budget today, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, we look forward to uh, the support of all members of the House uh, for that measure in the, in the federal budget. Okay, the next question, the member for Willowdale. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I want to talk about the data from last week, April 11th to 17th. It's not all in yet, but it shows that at least 16 international flights landed at Pearson Airport with confirmed cases of COVID-19. On these flights combined, more than 120 rows of passengers are considered affected by confirmed positive cases. Speaker, depending on the size of the planes, we're talking about maybe 350 to 700 passengers or more. The spread of COVID-19 and dangerous, dangerous variants of concerns is only made worse by cases coming in from other countries. Speaker, will our government call on the federal government to secure our airports as the federal government should have done many months ago? Government I want to, uh, again, thank the Honourable Member uh, for the question. I, I know how important it is not only to he and, and, uh, and his community, uh, look, recognizing the fact that uh, Toronto, Peel, uh, and York Region uh, are three of the most hardest hit regions, having been in lockdown since, uh, since November, Mr. Speaker. The member is quite correct. Order. Uh, uh, international flights and, and in, in, in many cases, domestic flights have been a serious uh, uh, cause uh, uh, for spread, community spread, Mr. Speaker. The Premier was well ahead of this, and it wasn't just our Premier, it was Premier's uh, in, uh, in some of the larger cities uh, where we're now seeing a, a third wave impact most significantly. We're all calling on the federal government to take control of our borders, to institute testing at the borders, to, to, to provide isolation centers at the borders. It was the premiers of these provinces that had to take steps in, abs in the absence of federal uh, leadership on this, but we can still, the federal government can still do the right thing, take control of, the, of our international borders so that we can control these variants of concern, Mr. Speaker. There is still time to do this, and when you Response. see the numbers each and every week, uh, the threat is, is, is continuous and we need to take action right away. So I call on the federal government to do that. The supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I'm glad the government House Leader brings up domestic flights because the data available also shows that four domestic flights landed at Pearson with confirmed cases of COVID-19. That's combined on these planes, Speaker, 20 rows of passengers that are considered affected by confirmed positive cases. And depending on the size of the planes, we're talking about maybe 60 to 120 passengers, Speaker. The spread of COVID-19 and these variants of concern are only made worse by cases coming in from other provinces. Speaker, will the government call on the federal government, secure our airports as they should have done a long time ago? Government House Leader. Uh, yes, again, Mr. Speaker, it is, it is very important, and it cannot be understated how important it is. And while we appreciate the assistance of the, of the federal government on issues where, uh, where we can work cooperatively, we are pleading with the federal government to do its part to secure our international borders, uh, Mr. Speaker. When you see what is happening at our, at our airports, uh, the, the member was very correct in highlighting the data. We're talking thousands of people who are coming through our borders, uh, in, possibly infected hundreds of, uh, of Ontario residents, putting more stress on our health care system, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we need the federal government to move quickly to do this. We have been calling on this for months. Before the variants of concern started uh, uh, having such an impact on the province of Ontario, we begged them to do this, Mr. Speaker. There is still time. They can still institute a better uh, testing at our airports. They can bring the airports down. They can close those international Response. airports. And when you see the impact it also having on domestic flights, Mr. Speaker, now is the time for the federal government to work with us to secure our international borders so that we can defeat COVID-19 once and for all. Thank you. Next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, doctors have been warning that our ICUs were in crisis and that in communities like Brampton, essential workers and their entire families were getting sicker much faster. But on Friday, as hospitals and ICUs were on the verge of bursting, and as case counts and outbreaks were at all-time highs, and as thousands of doctors and nurses were struggling to keep people alive, Dr. Williams, this government's top COVID advisor, just shrugged his shoulders and said that there was nothing that could be done. Speaker, there was a lot that could have been done. This government could have implemented paid sick days to help save lives, 
They could have provided vaccinations in hotspot communities, but they failed to do that. To say that there was nothing more that could have been done is just horrifying. And it shows that this government just simply doesn't care, Speaker. My question to the Minister of Health. Question. Will she denounce Dr. Williams' heartless comments and finally take some responsibility for this crisis that her and this government are responsible for? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. And I would say to the honourable member through you, Mr. Speaker, that um, Dr. Williams has done an incredible job for this province. Over the course of this pandemic, he has provided invaluable advice to us as a government, along with the public health measures table, the science advisory table, and numerous others. We are indebted to him for the work he has done. Any suggestion that he made that he couldn't have done anything about it, I'm sure, was with respect to the fact that these variants of concern are so much more transmissible, relate to so many more hospitalizations, so many more people in acute care and ICUs, and unfortunately, many more deaths, including young people. Dr. Williams is dedicated to preserving the lives and safety of the people of Ontario, as is our government, and we are taking every step possible to make sure that we can do that. Supplementary question. Speaker, doctors don't feel like this government is doing everything that it possibly can. And I'll quote some of these leading experts. From Dr. Michael Warner, quote, I do feel defeated. I'm kind of past anger and on to defeat, end quote. From Dr. Brooke Fallis, a critical care doctor at Brampton Civic Hospital, it just felt like today was sending a whole lot of people to their death when they didn't have to, end quote. Speaker, through you, again to the Minister of Health. These are the words of doctors, nurses, and science table advisors. Yet the government keeps pretending that there's nothing more that they could have done. Speaker, how many more people need to die in this province before this government is going to step up with a plan and help us get through this third wave and help us save lives in the province Question. of Ontario? How many more people need to die before they will take action, Speaker? Thank you, Speaker. In fact, our government does have a plan that has been informed by medical experts in the COVID-19 Vaccine Distribution Task Force. The goal of all of us, which I'm sure is of yours as well, is to save lives, protect people, make sure that they're going to be safe. That's why our vaccine rollout is Order. going to start with age, risk, and the hotspots. That's why we have Order. distributed 25 per cent of the vaccines off the top to those hot spots, making sure that those people living in those areas can be protected, receive the vaccine, which will Member be for Brampton Centre to come to across order. the entire province. That's why we've had to postpone some of the scheduled surgeries. That's why we're rolling out more people to help with deployment of forces from different areas. That's why we're having to transfer patients in some cases to make sure that we can use our entire health system, every single part of it, in every Every part of this province to save lives. That's the goal. That's the plan. That's what we're doing. Thank you. The next question, the member for Guelph. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. On February 11th, the chair of your science advisory table predicted a disaster if the government eased restrictions. The government did indeed ease restrictions against the public advice of many public health care officials and scientists and the disaster is here. But instead of paid sick days and safe workplaces, the Premier on Friday closed playgrounds and enhanced police powers. Public health officials were shocked and angry, and yet the government today keeps saying they are following the advice of scientists and public health officials. So, Speaker, will the Premier commit today to sharing the scientific data and public health data table advice that led to his decision to close playgrounds and institute carding instead of focusing on making workplaces safe and helping essential workers stay safe in the workplace. 
Minister of Health to reply. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. And I can certainly advise that all of the information that was provided to us by the science advisory table has been provided to you and provided to the people of Ontario. Dr. Brown has been very outstanding in providing public health measures, the advice of the science advisory table, what is being what is happening across in Ontario, and what we've seen in the last month or so is an incredible rise in the number of cases due to the variants of concern. We anticipated that based on what they told us, and we have been building up, building up our hosp hospital capacity, building up our health human resources, trying to build up our vaccine supply, and we are working with the federal government, but several of the Order. treatments have been delayed. Notwithstanding that, we are working very hard to get as many needles into as many arms as possible in order to stop the Response. transmission and protect the people of Ontario. The supplementary question. Speaker. I ask that question because public trust is vital to combating this pandemic. And how can we build public trust when so many public health officials, doctors, nurses, and scientists, and other experts are essentially saying that the government is not following their advice? My gosh, even one of their own caucus members, a member from Scarborough Centre, put out a letter asking for the data their own caucus member. So, Speaker, how can we expect the public to be on our side if we're not going to be open and honest with them? Dr. Uni talked about Friday being the darkest day of his career. And so, Speaker, I'm, I'm asking, I'm actually through you pleading, will the government please release the data, be transparent, be, have the information accessible to the people of Ontario so we can indeed all be together and have the information we need to make the right public health decisions in the province. Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. I can understand the concern you're expressing, uh, to, I would say to the honourable member, but this information has been released. This information is released by Dr. Brown on a regular basis. I know that Dr. Uni works with them, Dr. Sander works with them. There's a number of public health doctors, epidemiologists that are working on this, trying to give us an indication of where we are going with this, which has been uh, exacerbated times 10 by the variants of concern. We knew this was coming. That's why we've been taking steps in order to deal with it both in terms of blunting transmission, but also by building hospital capacity. We are working on both of those aspects right now to make sure that we can take care of the people who are coming into the hospital with COVID-19 and to do whatever we can to blunt that transmission because it's happening in the community. Now, with respect to the playgrounds, we heard what people said. We understand from many Response. that it's very important for children to be able to get out to get some physical exercise is good for their physical and mental health. We understand that. But we are still asking people to please continue to follow those public health measures. What Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question. The member for Willowdale. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Last week, Moderna announced that they were cutting one of Canada's vaccine shipments in half. We were supposed to receive 1.2 million doses, but now we will receive just 600,000. In Ontario, Speaker, COVID-19 case numbers continue to rise, and the vaccines are desperately needed, and they just aren't here. Today, Mr. Speaker, we were supposed to receive 448,000 doses of Moderna, but I'm sad to say that they have not arrived. Speaker, will the government tell this House, my question is for the government House Leader, where are the vaccines and when will we get them? Again, I, I want to thank the honourable gentleman uh, uh, for the question. It's an important question, especially in light of the fact that uh, his community, uh, Toronto, uh, uh, Peel, and York, uh, are three of the communities that been, have been under lockdown since really since uh, since November. Obviously, we are anticipating a significant uh, uh, delivery of, uh, of Moderna vaccines. It's not the first time that this has happened, but yet again, uh, we've been disappointed. This is, uh, I believe, the third time this has happened, and really, this has happened in February, March, and now into April. Vaccines that we were promised have not been delivered, which has
has caused us to modify uh, the, the public health uh, safety measures that we have to, uh, uh, to do to keep our province uh, safe, Mr. Speaker. So we really, are, we, we really need to have uh, uh, proper information from the federal government with respect to the supply of vaccines, when they're coming, what we can expect, Mr. Speaker. It has become increasingly more difficult for us to defeat COVID without the vaccines that we've needed. We're hearing from members across the aisle and from members in our own, uh, in our own ridings when clinics have to, be, uh, have to be canceled or delayed because of the lack of, uh, of vaccines, Mr. Speaker. It is a problem that the federal government needs to address immediately. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. This just it's, it's not acceptable. I mean, south of the border in the United States and around the world, uh, jurisdictions are able to procure vaccines, and that's just not happening here in, in Canada, unfortunately. And, Speaker, appointments are no good if you don't have vaccines to fill them. We are 500,000 doses behind, and, and that is just in the last week. Speaker, my question, again, through you to the, the government House Leader, will Ontario call on the federal government to get their act together and get Ontario the vaccine doses that we desperately need? Again, yes, I, again, and I sense that I, I do feel the member's frustration. I, I, I really do. I know how hard he has worked for his community. I know how, how difficult this challenge has been for the City of Toronto and for other regions that have been in lockdown in the province for so long. I know that he's frustrated when he hears uh, uh, the impact that our international airports have had on his community with respect to the thousands of people, uh, the variants of concern that have been brought into the country from other jurisdictions without a federal partner willing to take action for us. But ultimately, Mr. Speaker, in February, in March and in April, we continue to see massive delays in vaccine distribution, not only to the province of Ontario, but across the, across the, the country, Mr. Speaker. And we need desperately to have a partner in Ottawa who can give us a secure supply of vaccines so that we can continue with our mass vaccination clinics across the, across the province, so that we can go into these essential workplaces, so that we can continue to increase, uh, vaccinations for uh, uh, hard-hit uh, communities, Mr. Speaker. But we can't do it without vaccines, so we need the federal government to step up to the plate and provide that secure Order. shipment of vaccines. Thank you. Next question, member for Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question for the Premier. Despite calls from public health experts saying that the only way to stop the pandemic from getting worse was to immediately bring in paid sick days, paid time off to get vaccinated, and ensuring that people could stay home when they can stay safe, where they can afford to stay safe, the Premier decided he apparently knows much better. His big brain solution? Give the police power to stop and fine anyone outside of the House. That's right, Speaker. Not only do frontline essential workers have no choice but to keep going into work, even if they're sick, the Premier thought it would be a good idea to make sure that they could get stopped and fined on their way to work, too. My question, Speaker, through you to the Premier, on what planet did you think this was going to help anybody? Solicitor General. Thank you. You know, it is critical for all Ontarians to respect the stay-at-home order and stop the spread of COVID-19 and the very, very uh, transmissible variants. Although the mass majority of Ontarians have respected public health measures put in place, certain individuals continue to put others at risk by gathering with those outside of their household. Our priority has always been to address and discourage gatherings and crowds that violate the stay-at-home order and have the potential to further spread COVID-19. That is why we provided police with the additional temporary authority to enforce the stay-at-home order by putting a stop to gatherings and crowds. Thank you. A supplementary question. Speaker, minutes after the Premier rolled out his half-baked plan to try and arrest his way out of the pandemic, police forces all across the province started to push back, saying they wouldn't enforce the rules and they didn't want the increased powers. Mayors and councils warned that the Premier's plan was only going to hurt frontline workers and communities that have already been hardest hit by the crisis. Lawyers and civil rights groups warned that criminalizing people for being outside was going to create more problems for everyone. Speaker, my question again to the Premier, through you, the cops, the municipalities, the legal community, literally everyone thought it was a bad idea. Why did you think you knew better? I invite the member to make his comments through the chair. 
I will allow the Solicitor General to reply. Thank you, Speaker. You know, it's been pretty clear that the public health guidance remains for people to stay at home. We have refocused Ontario Reg 8-21 enforcement of COVID-19 measures, and it clearly states if a police officer or other provincial offences officer has reason to suspect that you are participating in an organized public event or social gathering, they may require you to provide information to ensure you are complying with the restrictions. This is all about limiting mobility to keep people safe and make sure that the COVID variants don't go rapidly through our communities. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My, spe uh, my question is for the Premier. Speaker, we know that this has been a dark year for everyone in the country. For some, it's been darker than others, but people in Ontario have needed government more than at any time in most of our lives. Quick and difficult decisions have been required as circumstances have changed. By definition, in these circumstances, Mr. Speaker, we could expect some mistakes to be made. But, Mr. Speaker, we should also expect that this government would learn from mistakes. Time and time again, epidemiologists, ICU doctors and nurses, education workers on the front line, women working in childcare and groceries and in factories have called for protective measures. And time and time again, this government has either ignored the calls for paid sick leave, for example, or they've been dragged in the case of making educators in hotspots a priority for vaccination. So, Mr. Speaker, then we had Friday's announcement Question. and Saturday's reversal, an announcement of half measures and a reversal of only the most ineffective, probably unconstitutional of those measures. Speaker, to the Premier, clearly the decision-making process has broken down. What is the Premier going to do to ensure that the confusion and anger of this past weekend does not happen again? What will he change? Government House Leader, do you Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I do appreciate the answer from, uh, or the question from the, the member opposite. Uh, uh, look, Mr. Speaker, these have been very difficult times. This is a pandemic that nobody was expecting, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, but we have been working full on to ensure that the people of the province of Ontario are safe, Mr. Speaker. That includes uh, increased capacity uh, in our ICUs. That includes increased capacity in our in our hospitals. That includes uh, record numbers of new builds for our long-term uh, care homes, Mr. Speaker. We are fighting back right now with respect to the vaccine that we do have going into the communities, uh, the hotspot communities, vaccinating uh, essential workers, Mr. Speaker. We are doing all that we can, working with our partners municipally, working with the federal government when we can, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that people are safe, Mr. Speaker. But ultimately, ultimately, it comes down to the same thing. We need people to stay home when they can, Mr. Speaker. We need to reduce mobility because the variants of con concern are out of control. And until we get control of those uh, international borders, this will not stop. Until we get more vaccines, this will not stop, Mr. Speaker. But we are in control and we are doing all that we can. Thank you. Thank you. A supplementary question. So, Mr. Speaker, the point that I was making in my first question was that, in fact, to that list of things that you've done, and I know you are all working hard, and I know you've had a really bad weekend, so I have some empathy for that. I really do. And that's a personal comment. I absolutely do. But, Mr. Speaker, what has been done is not working, and the decision-making process is not working. So even if the Premier institutes a cabinet shuffle, something has to change. Different voices need to be heeded not just heard. Teachers, education workers, and childcare workers, for example, need to be vaccinated. We know it's critical that we get our kids back into school. Would it not make sense, for example, to use this time when school buildings are largely empty to make all those workers who have contact with kids, childcare workers, all our education workers, a priority and ensure that they're all vaccinated before they go back into those buildings, not sure. just in hotspots, but across the province? Can the Premier tell all of us what is his plan for getting the vaccine into the arms of all the people who work with our children, and how is the decision-making process going to change? Mr. Speaker, I have said on a number of occasions uh, that uh, this government has been focused on uh, repairing 15 years' worth of damage that was left behind by the previous Liberal government. I said in an answer last week that it has been more difficult uh, to face the challenges of COVID-19 because of the lack of investment that was made by the previous Liberal government. Order. They have left us with the lowest order. ICU capacity. The lowest ICU. Member for Don Valley West will come to order. Government House Leader, please. Continue. They have left us with the lowest ICU capacity per capita in North America, Mr. Speaker. This 
particular member, while Premier, built a lousy 400 long-term care beds. That's it, Mr. Speaker. 400 long-term care beds is her record. At this opposite token, what have we done? We've poured billions of dollars into health care, Mr. Speaker, to recoup because they did not. We put more money to build new ICU capacity, more money into critical care capacity, more money into long-term care capacity, Mr. Speaker. We are doing the job that she as Premier failed to do for the people. The next question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, on Friday, the Premier told Ontarians that everything is on the field now. Ontarians might reasonably have expected that everything would include paid sick days, as Dr. Brown had recommended just a few hours earlier. They might have expected the Premier to announce my Stay Home If You Are Sick Act so that workers, essential workers wouldn't have to make the impossible choice about uh, going to work sick or paying the rent. Speaker, public health experts are angry and in despair. They know that things will keep getting worse if this government fails to act to reduce workplace spread. Speaker, when will this government give Ontario workers the paid sick days that they and we so desperately need? Of labor training and skills development. Well, thank you very much. And the member opposite knows that the very first measure our government took decisive action to bring in job protected leave. If any worker needs to be in self isolation and quarantine, if they need uh, time off to get a vaccination, they can't be fired for that. Uh, furthermore, uh, Mr. Speaker, we continued uh, since day one to advocate on behalf of workers uh, to the federal government. There's now uh, 20 paid sick days available uh, to workers in Ontario. They can apply at canada.ca forward slash COVID-19. In fact, uh, Mr. Speaker, well over 300,000 workers uh, have either received this benefit or are receiving it uh, today. But as a member opposite knows, uh, we've been raising uh, issues to the federal government. There will be a federal budget this afternoon. We want to see improvements to the paid sick day program. The supplementary question. Speaker, unpaid leave does nothing to help workers pay the bills. The government's own science table stated that the federal program is not good enough. They said that without a provincial paid sick days program, things will keep getting worse. Speaker, a retroactive federal program that requires workers to go online to apply, to wait days, sometimes a week uh, or more without pay, and then that doesn't even come close to replacing their salary while they stay home is not going to keep anyone safe, which is why Ontario workers aren't applying. Workers need help today. They needed it last year when the Premier first rejected the inadequate federal program. So again to the Premier, when will this government pass my bill and stop forcing Ontarians to put their lives at risk? Mr. Labor. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to uh, ensure that the health and safety of workers is protected. In fact, Mr. Speaker, our government has invested more than $51 billion providing uh, additional investment into the health care system, billions of dollars uh, to help uh, individuals and families and businesses to get through this pandemic. Mr. Speaker, it was because of the advocacy of this Premier that uh, we have 20 paid sick days here in Ontario uh, for all workers. And the member opposite knows more than 300,000 workers uh, have either received uh, the benefit through the federal program or are receiving it uh, as we speak. Furthermore, 2.3 million workers in this province have paid sick days through their employers. Uh, all the provinces, Mr. Speaker, ensured that there was a job-protected leave. That's what we've done, but we've gone further. We've advocated to the federal government to improve the program. The federal budget's at 4 o'clock today. We'll see what improvements they bring forward. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The Premier's announcement on Friday evoked a lot of emotions. Mostly people are losing hope. Announcing that playgrounds would be shuttered and police would conduct street checks was met with outrage. The people rose up and said, not every child has a backyard they can play in. And the police said, it's a pandemic and we're here to help people, not to hinder them. And for a year now, reasonable people have been calling on the Premier to reinstate paid sick days because they save lives. Everyone knows there's a gap, and the Premier can't hide behind the CSRB. Because 
Last June, we wouldn't have had that program if the Premier had had his way. Ontarians need a Premier that's going to fill that gap that he created in June to, in 2018 when he took paid sick days away. So will the Premier do the right thing today and reinstitute paid sick days in Ontario? Right. <laughs> to reply, the Minister of Labour. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite knows uh, the, that the very first measure our government took was to bring in job-protected leave for every worker. In fact, we were uh, the first jurisdiction in the country to do that. If you're a worker in self-isolation, in quarantine, uh, if you're a mom or a dad that can't stay home and look after a son or a daughter because of the disruptions uh, to the school system, you can't be fired for that. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, we were the first jurisdiction to bring in uh, job-protected leave for uh, vaccinations. Uh, so workers are protected so they can go and get vaccinated. But Mr. Speaker, the member opposite has a responsibility to the people of Ontario to let them know that there's four weeks of paid sick days through the federal government, which is the same for all workers across the entire country. All workers need to go to canada.ca forward slash COVID-19 to ensure that they receive the benefit. And Mr. Speaker, Response? 300,000 workers in Ontario have either received this benefit or are receiving it today. The supplementary question. Speaker, the minister knows there's a gap. So I want you to think about this. Imagine you're a low-wage worker. Maybe you work two jobs, you work in a warehouse. You've got three kids and your wife and your mother-in-law at home. And they depend on you for rent and food and maybe medication, and you have no benefits. You wake up sick one morning. You're not feeling well, but you're not sure. So do you stay home or do you do what you need to do to make sure your family can survive? And we know firsthand that too many people are going to work in that situation. The gap exists. The federal program doesn't cover you if you're off for a couple of days. It doesn't come on your paycheck. What we're asking for is for the Premier to stand behind essential workers. He's not doing that. He's not filling that gap. And last June, if he had his way, we wouldn't have had the CSRB. So stop saying that's the solution, because you know it's not. You need to do something. So, Speaker, through Question. you, will the Premier commit to debating this Thursday MPP Coteau's bill, 247 on paid sick days, and pass it here in this legislature? And I'll remind members to make their comments through the chair, Government House Leader. Respect to the bill, Mr. Speaker, uh, I know that's uh, in front of the, the legislature, I believe, Thursday, and uh, and we will see. But look, it was this uh, this premier who negotiated a uh, comprehensive return to work protocol, which included uh, sick days, Mr. Speaker. At the same time, I note uh, that it was the uh, uh, former NDP uh, member of provincial parliament and now the leader of the of the federal NDP who claimed credit that this is a benefit that would cover all Ontario workers, and frankly, it has. But it needs to be improved. We have said that right from the beginning. So there is a first federal budget today in two years. It should include uh, a, a, a payment for those who want to get vaccinated, essential workers who need to get vaccinated, and it should include the, include the elimination of the waiting period, given that there is such surplus in the Ontario account. I hope the member opposite will join with us in ensuring that that is in there, and I hope uh, the NDP will ensure that if it's not in there, that their leader will do the right thing and vote against a federal budget that does not include these members. I anxiously await uh, commentary from the member opposite if those measures aren't in there, but we fully expect that those enhanced measures will be there, which includes filling the gap, Mr. Speaker. For Ottawa South will come to order. That, that concludes our question period for this morning. I beg to